There's a scene I've always loved in the movie A Thousand Clowns. A man walks down a street feeling so guilty about something that he's done that he says out loud, I'm sorry. And a passerby replies, that's okay. <laughs> it makes him feel so much better that he spends the rest of the day standing on that street corner saying, I'm sorry, just so he can hear those blessed words, that's okay. Have you ever felt like that guy? Have you ever felt like your life was just one big apology? I have. And often, these were times, not when I was consciously doing something bad, but when I felt like I was never quite good enough. I had grown up with that Bible verse, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. I interpreted that to mean, be a perfect human. Make straight A's, have a perfect body, never say an unkind word, never leave your socks on the floor. <laughs> By those standards, I was a dismal failure. But I had a healing when I was just out of college that made me rethink that verse. And I'm still learning from it today. Learning how to plead not guilty. At that time, I thought I was not smart enough, not pretty enough, not a good enough dancer, not even a good enough housekeeper. I thought I had disappointed God. On the surface, I was doing pretty well, but there was always that little voice whispering in my ear saying, not good enough. Then I got sick. Over a period of weeks, I wasn't able to retain any food, and I was weak and feverish and in a lot of pain. I called a Christian science practitioner to pray with me about this. Now, in case you're not familiar with that term, a practitioner is someone who gives full time to healing prayer in Christian science. As the days passed, I got more and more frightened, and one night I reached a crisis. My mom called the practitioner who had been praying with me, and she told him of my fear that I might be dying. He asked her to read me page 391 in Mary Baker Eddy's book, Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures. When she got down right near the bottom of the page, there was one sentence that really struck me. It said, when the body is supposed to say, I am sick, Never plead guilty. I saw that I needed to stop pleading guilty of sickness. I needed to rise up in rebellion against any suggestion that somehow I deserved all this suffering and that I didn't qualify for a healing because I wasn't good enough. That night, my mom was like a warrior woman. Every time I would cry out in pain, my mom would say, not guilty, not guilty. <laughs> Early in the morning, the dawn began to break in my thought. In the most gentle way, I saw that I was not guilty of being immortal. So I couldn't be guilty of all the shortcomings that stem from mortality. I had never failed to be the pure expression of God's being. I fell asleep. And as my mom left my room, she thought about that beatitude. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Mom saw that I had been hungering and thirsting after real righteousness, not self-righteousness, but consistent right thinking and acting. And God's promise was that I would be filled. When I woke up the next morning, the pain and the fever were gone. I was hungry for the first time in weeks, and I ate a normal breakfast. I was getting just a taste 
of how good God was and how completely he loved me. It was as if I could hear a voice saying, Julie, you're my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. I'm still learning what that means today. I used to think I was the only one who had that feeling of chronic guilt, but as I've talked to others, I've heard so many other people feeling the same way. It's as if we're all asking, how can God love me if I don't even love myself? I believe that we can love ourselves because God loves us. God knows your innocence. The verdict is in, and you are not guilty. Not guilty of disappointing God, not guilty of creating your own problems, and not guilty of spiritual ignorance. Now let's take those three charges one at a time. First, you're not guilty of disappointing God. You're not too fat, too thin, too dumb, too lazy. God made you in his own image and likeness. We learned this in the first chapter of Genesis. God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. Not kind of good, or sort of good, but very good. If you think about reflection, the image has to be just like the original. It can't go off on its own and do something that the original isn't doing. The image and the original must always agree. And they're inseparable. More than anyone else in the history of mankind, Christ Jesus knew this and lived it. You could sum up his whole career in one simple sentence. I and my Father are one. When Jesus was baptized, the Bible tells us that he saw the Spirit of God descending upon him like a dove. And he heard a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Is it possible that you and I could feel that same Spirit descending on us like a gentle dove? Is it possible that we could hear a voice saying, You are my beloved son or daughter, in whom I am well pleased? Yes, but it takes humility to hear those words and believe them. We have to trust God more than we trust our own opinions. And we have to lay down that concept of good as a personal possession. If we think we could divorce good from its divine source and turn it into your good and my good, then we might misuse good. We might withhold it or waste it. But Jesus knew that there was only one good. When a young man referred to him as good master, he said, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one. That is God. That indivisible good. When we know it, we are no longer tempted to compare ourselves, to always try to be good enough. God does not give grades. He doesn't arrange his ideas on a scale of good and better and best. Because he is infinite good, every expression of him has to reflect that infinite, indivisible good. Not your good and my good, but infinite good infinitely expressed. When we understand this, we are freed from the addiction to human approval, even our own. It's enough that God knows our real selfhood 
and that he loves us completely. So we're not guilty on the first count. Not guilty of disappointing God. And this is the second thing you're not guilty of. You're not guilty of causing your own problems. Do you know the old age-old question, why me, Lord? Sometimes when we hit a bump in the road, our first impulse is to say, what did I do to deserve this? Have you ever asked that question? I have. I remember sitting in the office of a Christian science practitioner sobbing and saying, how can I have so many problems when I'm trying so hard to be good? He paused for a minute and then he said to me, my dear, your progress has brought it to the surface to be healed. Suddenly it was a whole new ball game. An opportunity for growth, brought about by growth, not by failure. He explained to me that when we come on a tough problem, right where that problem seems to be, there is a new view of divine goodness and love just asking to be seen. Mary Baker Eddy said it this way in Science and Health, the very circumstance which your suffering sense deems wrathful and afflictive Love can make an angel entertained unawares. So don't waste your time on the why me question. Look for the angel. Look for that new view of divine goodness and love, that fresh inspiration that reveals your life in a whole new light. When you think about it, we're not capable of creating problems. God is the only creator, and he creates solutions. The God who is infinite love does not use evil to teach us to be good. The God who is infinite love doesn't set us up to fail and then turn around and punish us for it. The God who is infinite intelligence doesn't make us learn from our mistakes. He doesn't make mistakes, and neither does his image and likeness. So, you are not guilty on the second count. You are not guilty of causing your own problems. Mary Baker Eddy glimpsed this even as a young girl. She grew up in a family where the Bible was constantly read and discussed, but she was troubled by the doctrine of predestination that God chose some people for eternal salvation, but others for eternal damnation. When she was examined for, Im for membership in her family's church, she said that she could not accept that doctrine. Years later, in the very first sentence of the first chapter of her primary work, she wrote, the prayer that reforms the sinner and heals the sick is an absolute faith that all things are possible to God, a spiritual understanding of him, and unselfed love. There is no problem so complex or long-standing that it can't be dissolved in an instant by the power of infinite love. But we don't start with the problem and reason backwards. We start with God, who didn't create problems, who doesn't allow them. And when we understand that, we don't suffer from them. Not guilty of causing your own problems. And finally, you're not guilty of spiritual ignorance. That feeling that says, I'm just not getting it. Have you ever tried so hard to understand God and felt like it was just beyond your reach? It's not. Remember, God made you in his own image and likeness. How could he possibly withhold information from you? Sometimes in the midst of a healing, you get that uneasy feeling like you're standing in your own way and you say things like, I'm not good enough, I don't know enough, I haven't read enough, I haven't prayed enough. Have you ever done that? I said that once to a friend and she woke me right up. She gave me a line from Science and Health. It says, the depth, breadth, 
height, might, majesty, and glory of infinite love fill all space. That is enough. And it is enough. It is enough. Don't focus on what you don't know. Focus on what God does know. And you will see your freedom. It's enough. There is a new view of divine goodness and love asking to be seen. It's already here. It's already yours. And no personal sense of inadequacy can possibly hide it from you. So, you're not guilty on all three counts. Not guilty of disappointing God, not guilty of causing your own problems, and not guilty of spiritual ignorance. And you know what happens when you're cleared on all counts. You're free. Now you may be saying, but what if I've done something really bad? Take heart. God still loves you. And it is never too late to change. Sometimes that involves admitting our errors, but we don't just leave it there. We uncover them, and we correct them, and we move on. The Bible is full of people who did not have perfect human lives. Moses killed a soldier who was beating a slave. David arranged to have a man killed in battle so that he could marry his wife. Saul viciously persecuted the early Christians. But in his conversion, Paul became one of the great voices of Christianity. Each one of these men must have struggled mightily with guilt. But they didn't give it the final word. They repented and reformed. They were born again. And you can be too. When our son was just a little boy, sometimes he'd get himself into trouble. And his daddy would pick him up and he would say to him so gently, you know, you can always change your mind. And he would. In the presence of that uncondemning love, he could step back and make a better decision. He could be himself. I like to think that that's what God is saying to us. You know, you can always change your mind. You can always reclaim your sinless spiritual identity. You don't have to carry around a history of past mistakes. Remember, you're God's beloved child in whom he is well pleased. Stand up for your innocence and know that God is standing with you, supporting every right desire. You are not guilty. Thank you.